first of all, thank all of you. Thank you all of you for turning up. It's a Saturday afternoon. And on behalf of the CFI team and everyone else who helped organize this event, thank you for showing up. Uh, I'd just like to introduce Manish to all of you. Uh, Manish began his career with Tel Labs before he founded his own IT consulting firm, Translate, which he later sold to Kurt Sound Associate. And that's when he made the switch to money management. He founded Tobdai Investment Funds in 1999. He's perhaps best known for winning, for bidding $650,000 for a charity lunch with uh, Warren Buffett. And he's adopted Warren Buffett's value-based investing approach for his own funds. And he's even authored two books on the same approach to investing. Today, he works with the Dakshina Foundation, which he helped found in 2005, to focus on alleviating poverty by helping to tutor underprivileged children and enabling them to attend some of the country's best institutes of higher learning. And I can see a lot of you out here today. But without any further ado, I'd like to give you Manish Pabrak. Great, uh, great to be back at uh, ISP. Thanks for having me back. I think last time uh, I was kind of winging it, so this time I thought I'd uh, do a little more prep. And again, I think I think before I launch into compounding and investing and so on, I just wanted to share just a little bit of a uh, couple of thoughts I had on uh, ISP actually before there was an ISP. And uh, you know, I, I, I used to live in Chicago in the 1990s and in the mid 90s, early some of the professors at Northwestern University, Kellogg School and uh, Rajat Gupta and such uh, would talk about this Indian school of business in a, you know, it was kind of, much of it was in their heads. And even I think uh, one time broken bread with, uh, with Rajat, of course, known him for a few years. And of course, here we are today, we have a amazing institution that's thriving and doing really well. And I just wanted to actually spend a minute or two on Rajat because I think that even if you don't get any value from the presentation I'm making, I think there's, a, you can say, a Shakespearean value in some of the events that have transpired. You know, my heroes, uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, say that uh, envy is one of the worst of all the human vices that you can have. In fact, many other human vices, you can get an upside from having those vices, but with envy, if you have envy, towards anybody, all that's going to happen is you're going to feel bad. In the case of Rajat, you know, he was off the chart successful, but his downfall was led by two things. I think the two traits, basic human traits. And one was envy. He was envious of a person who was much more successful than him, at least on paper, and uh, much less capable than him, which is probably true. And the second is uh, ego. And ego is nothing but a false sense of self. So, you know, all of us are uh, ashes and dust. We came from ashes and dust and we will be ashes and dust. And it's uh, useful to remember that. Or like a good friend of mine always says, everyone burps and farts. So basically, if you, if you were to basically eliminate envy from your life, and if you were to eliminate as much as you can, ego, you're very far along the, world, the path of doing quite well. With that, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started, and we can uh, we can start the PowerPoint. Basically, I'm going to talk about uh, an, a very old Indian uh, tale. Actually, most of us probably grew up with. It's a tale about the invention of the game of chess. So, the game of chess was invented about uh, 1400 years ago, 70 score and four years ago. This guy who invented the game when he showed it to the king. The king immediately became a big chess fan and was playing all the time. And so he told uh, the inventor of the game that, you know, ask for any reward and it shall be yours. So the inventor says that uh, what I want is I want you to put one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard. And I want you to put two grains of rice on the second board of the chessboard. And I want you to put four grains on the third board, uh, third square and keep doubling the grains on every square. Just when you get to the 64th square, then that is the amount of rice I'd like and that's all I want. Of course, the king thought that this was a very stupid request. And he said, I wanted to give you such a big reward and this is all you want, a bunch of rice. So he told his treasurer, measure out the rice that this guy needs and get him out of my court. About a week went by and the guy hadn't figured it out yet. So he called the treasurer back in and said, why are you taking so much time? He said, well, it took me a while to run the calculation 
and it turns out that we don't have the rice. Not only do we don't have it in our granary, we don't have it in the kingdom. And not only do we not have it in the kingdom, it doesn't exist on planet Earth. You know, that is the power of compounding. So if you took that uh, amount of rice, which is going from 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on, you know, we have a bunch of people who are going to IIT soon. So how many grains of rice on their chessboard? Anyone raise their hands? Over here? No? Accidental raising of the hand? Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. 2 to the, two to the power 64 minus 1. Okay, I won't ask you to lay out the whole number. So if you, if you calculate that uh, amount of rice in terms of present rice prices, it works out to $300 trillion. And of course, $300 trillion is a big, big number. The entire net worth of every man, woman, and child in the United States is $70 trillion. And the entire net worth of every man, woman, and child on the entire planet is just about $300 trillion. So basically what the guy asked for would be pretty much the entire wealth of the planet. That is the power of compounding. And that is why Einstein calls it the eighth wonder of the world. You know, this story of chess that I told you is something I'm sure most of you already heard before. In fact, I heard about it when I was a kid. In uh, 1994, I was 30 years old and I heard about Warren Buffett for the first time. When I heard of Warren, I had really no knowledge of investments or you know, capital allocation or any of those things. What I was lucky about in 94 was the first couple of biographies in Warren Buffett had just come out at the time. And so I could look at this track record that Warren Buffett had from 1950 to 1993. It was a 44-year track record. Over that 44-year period, he had compounded money at 31% a year. If you compound money at 31% a year, and I'll show you later, if you compound money at 26% a year, it will double every three years. 1.26 times 1.26 times 1.26 is two. And if you're compounding at 31% a year, you will double your money in little less than three years, maybe two and a half years or 2.6 years or something. With Warren Buffett for 44 years, had compounded at 31%. He was already on the 18th square of the chessboard when I first heard about him because he had compounded. And so, you know, I thought back to the story about the chess and the rice and so on and I talked to Warren and I said, wow, this guy is actually playing out that chessboard story. That, that story is very powerful because if you keep doing it and if he keeps doing it, he's going to become the wealthiest person on the planet. And he became the wealthiest person on the planet. So it works. But you know, when I, when I was thinking about all these things, uh, like I said, I've never been to business school and really hadn't thought much about investments. A few things kind of stood out for me. You know, basically the investing world, hardly anyone followed Warren Buffett and his approach to investing in 1994 and even today. Hardly anyone had the returns that he had. So the investing professionals, if you will, did not follow Warren's approach to investing and did not have the results that Warren Buffett had. And I thought those two, those two facts were cause and effect. I thought that the Buffett approach was the approach to kind of high, high rates of compounding. And if you didn't follow the approach, you were basically not gonna go anywhere. And so I had these uh, thoughts that these things were related Buffett's approach uh, looked replicatable and no one was replicating. So I said, you know, I like this compounding. I like this 26% or 31% a year and why don't I give it a try? How many of you have uh, seen the movie Forrest Gump? So we get answers in the extreme front of the room and extreme back of the room. How many people in black shirts have seen the movie Forrest Gump? Okay, so when you go to IIT, uh, on YouTube, download the movie and watch the movie. Appreciate it. it. Actually won an Academy Award. It's a great movie. I'm just going to play for you about uh, one minute of the movie right now. So, uh, I never went back to work for the tenant So, I just got care of my public health money. He got me invested in some kind of fruit company. And so then I got a call from him saying, we don't have to worry about money no more. And I said, that's good. One less thing. 
Forrest Gump is my hero. I like Forrest Gump. You know, after I decided to do this replication of Warren Buffett's compounding, I changed my license plate. And of course, I think I, I might have mentioned some of the Dakshana scholars last time. But maybe for the people who are not in black shirts, what does my license plate mean? Maybe the, the ISB crowd can, can take a guess. So that's, that's my real California license plate on my real 6 Series BMW convertible. So uh, what does the plate mean? I'm sorry? Uh, no. <laughs> Compounding at? No, the LV is not lower bound. Anyone else? Yeah. I think it's found actually. Very good. Were you here last year? Yes. So uh, you're cheating on the test. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the LV means pound, you know, it's an abbreviation for pound. So compound 26. All right, so that's my license plate. I, I make sure I look at it every day. 1994, I was 30 years old. I had just sold some assets in this business I was running. Still had the business, just sold a small portion of it. And basically, I ended up with $1 million in the bank. And I really had no use for that money. It's the first time actually I had any kind of money in the bank. At the same time, I read these Buffett biographies and the chess overlaid with his uh, 18 square. So I said, hey, you know, why don't we focus on a very simple formula? 1.26 cube equals 2. I mean, I can handle that math, even though I didn't go to IIT. I decided to play a 30 year game. And so the 30 year game I decided to play was that if you uh, compound at 26% uh, a year, your money is going to double every three years, right? If it doubles every three years, then in 30 years, it's 2 to the power of 10. What is 2 to the power of 10? 1024. So forget the 24. Let's round off to 1000. So I had a million dollars. The plan was to compound at 26%. 30 years, I should add three zeros to that because it's 1,000 times whatever you had, and so it becomes a billion, which is a better number than a million. So I said, let's go for the billion. My thought was that even if I failed by 90% or 95% or even 97%, it's still okay. All those numbers are okay. So I decided I would play this game. And of course, my hero, Swami, Swami Vivekananda, told me, just like I tell all the Dakshna scholars, you just take up one idea, make that idea your life, think about it, dream of it, live on that idea. Let the brain, muscles and nerves, let every part of your body be full of that idea and just leave every other idea alone. That is the way to success. I think Swamiji said that for my benefit to compound money. That's my take on him anyway. So anyway, so this is what happened, you know, in. 1995, I started putting that million dollars to work. And for the next four and a half years, from 95 to middle of June, or middle of the year in 1999, it actually grew at 43.4%, way above the 26%. And the 1 million had become 5.1 million. So I said, all right, man, I knew this could be done. We got it done. And then, you know, I had all these friends, I should tell them, you know, different stocks they should buy and they used to make a lot of money with all the stock tips as to give them. So they came to me and said, listen, this stock tip business is very random. We want you to manage some money for us. And then you do what you want and we can have some benefit of that. So in July 1st of 99, I set up Cabrai Funds and it started with $1 million from eight friends of mine. I also put in 100,000. From 99 to 2007, middle of 2007, eight years, Pabrai funds compounded uh, before fees at 37.2% a year. And of course, I get paid outrageous fees. And so after fees, it was 29.4%, but both numbers are perfectly fine. So now, you know, more than 12 years have passed since I started this and things were working, going really well. Again, patted myself on the back. 
you know, doing well. And then all hell broke loose. And uh, for the next 21 months, we compounded at minus 47.1%. And I can just tell you, if you compound at minus 47.1% and the car starts going in reverse, the same thing happens in reverse really fast. Thankfully, that came to an end in 2009. And then for the last four and a quarter years, we've been compounding back again at about 32.8%. So now, it's been 18 and a half years. Actually, the slide is wrong. It's 18.5, but the numbers are right. It's 25.8%. So we undershot by 0.2%. But we still have uh, 11 and a half years to go. Maybe I can make that up. We'll see. So it's uh, pretty close. Of course, the good news is with investing, unlike tennis, is the more you play the game and the older you get, the better you get. So this is a game where over time you get better. So that's great. All knowledge is cumulated. That's also good. And of course, what the things that we own in the portfolio is very undervalued. So I think it will do well in the future. And uh, I'm excited to see how the next 11 and a half years unfold. How does one compound at 26%? Well, you cannot compound, you cannot beat the index by trying to beat the index. You have to try to do something different from what the index is doing. Basically, you make very few bets, you make very big bets, and you make infrequent bets, and you make bets with the odds are heavily in your favor. And in this business, you can be wrong a lot and still be okay. I mean, if you look at my record, I had a 21 month period where we actually had several investments go to zero. And we still look fine after that period. And of course, this is going somewhat off topic in the sense that we could do a separate presentation on each of these things. but. You know, if you focus on things like cannibals, companies that are buying back their own stock or spin-offs or clone what other people are doing, what other great investors are doing, which is what I do a lot of, things become a lot easier. Basically, the other thing is that, you know, I don't make investments unless we have at least the prospects of a double or a triple of the money in two or three years. And as the amount of money in the portfolio goes down, that number keeps going up. So for example, for the last 5% of assets or last 10% of assets, we need at least 5x or more. So that just makes sure that the money goes out during the most distressed times. And of course, uh, after, you know, 2009 and 2008, when I got whipsawed, if you will, I made some changes. So one of the things I, I came up with was this pre-investment checklist, which has been wonderful. In fact, I error rate is almost uh, zero since 2009. We have hardly had any any loss of capital. And that, that makes a big difference. And the second is that uh, I started having conversations with a fellow fund manager. And that was actually investment advice I got from Charlie Munger, who said that he always had somebody to talk to. And uh, until 2008, actually, I never talked to anyone, anyone about my investments. Uh, but now I always talk to the one person who is uh, exceptional, actually. It's worked out very well. And we don't always agree. In fact, we disagree more a lot of the time. But the conversations are still very helpful. So that's pretty much the song and dance. You just need to take a simple idea. You take it seriously. Compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. You know, you want to be a cloner. You know, I have no original ideas. Basically, in many, many different ways, I uh, copy Warren Buffett. And then, of course, you have to come up with your own license plate. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, play a five-minute Bollywood video for you to uh, put you in a better mood. So we'll play the, play the MP4, but maximum volume. And take the lights down. Thank you. And then we'll take your questions. Let it go.
ओके दिलो में तू आग लगा दे बेबी फायर नकली से न करे तू करे जब देखे हमें झूठी लायर काला काला चश्मा चचता तेरे मुखड़े पे जैसे काला दल जचता है तेरे चंद पे अपनी अदाओं से ज़्यादा नहीं तो दस बारा लड़क के तो मार ही देती होगी तू दिन में तुझे जैसे छत्ते से फिरते हैं मेरे बरगी और न होनी वे बरगी और न होनी बरगी 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 और न होनी तू मुंडा बिल्कुल देसी है मैं कट दी ना तो सूडी वे Oh, I, I never went back to work for Lieutenant Dan. Though he did take care of my Bubba Gump money, he got me invested in some kind of fruit company. And so then I got a call from him saying we don't have to worry about money no more. And I said, that's good. One less thing. Liar. Okay, so we'll uh, take your questions and uh, I think uh, we have a couple of mics, maybe if someone can just take the mics around then we can, all of us can hear the question. You can ask things that are in the presentation and I hope you ask things that are not in the presentation. So pretty much you can ask anything you want other than what I'm buying right now. Okay, my question is, you said it is replicable, the theory of well is replicable. But if it is that easy, why not everyone is doing that? And another thing, uh, how do you do that? For example, you say like uh, 50, 75 percent of the world is interested in industry, which would become two weeks in two to three years. But how do you decide that? Let me let me start with your first question because that's a very deep question. So you say, like you said, uh, I said it's not replicatable, but uh, no one is replicatable. So 
It took me a long time to figure this out. I'm just about uh, getting close to figuring it out. So there is something strange in the human genome. That something strange makes people, and the good news is we have some time, so I'll give you my expanded answer. Uh, that makes people very much opposed to being intense copycats. Humans, most humans, do not want to do cloning. And they do not want to do cloning because they consider it beneath themselves. And of course, low-life people like me do not consider cloning beneath myself, and so I'm willing to do it. So to give you an example, if you look at a company like Microsoft, Microsoft isn't even that great a cloner because anything they work on takes about three or five or seven versions. I'll get it right. Sorry, Ashok. Maybe you can make it better for them. But it takes them a long time. But bottom line is that most of Microsoft's revenue comes from Windows, which was cloned, comes from Office, which was cloned. You know, PowerPoint was actually bought from another company, Word was from WordPerfect, uh, Excel was from Lotus, and so on and so forth. And, you know, even SQL Server was uh, lifted from Oracle. And it just goes on and on. You can look at uh, Microsoft Money, you can look at Bing coming from Google, and so on. So, bottom line is that Microsoft isn't even that great a cloner, but it's one of the, you know, largest and most successful companies out there. You look at another company, and this is something that really perplexes me, is a company called Walmart. Sam Walton, uh, the people who knew him well, founder of Walmart, they would not call him a brilliant man. He was not someone who would have been uh, blowing off IQ tests, and I think most of the people in this room would have a higher IQ than Sam Walton. But Sam Walton, if he were alive today, he would have a net worth of about 150 billion, to be the richest person on the planet. And Walmart, for the first 20 years of its existence, did not come up with any innovation. All Walmart did was they looked at Kmart's model, and they looked at Sears' model, and they replicated that model. That's it. And in fact, you know, what I find really funny is that in India, uh, we had this big debate going on about letting, uh, let's digress for a second, foreign retailers in so that they can make things more efficient. And then they talk about Walmart coming in. There is nothing in Walmart's business model that, that anyone cannot look at by walking into a Walmart and replicating it. India does not need Walmart to come in in order for retail to become efficient. India just needs an entrepreneur to look at that model and replicate it. That's it. There's nothing else needed. So there is, there is nothing special about Walmart's model. There's nothing special about Microsoft's model. And it goes on and on. Uh, McDonald's, for example, they have a whole army of people, a whole departments, which spend all their time trying to figure out which is the next location they should put the next McDonald's in. They do a lot of studies and analysis to figure out demographics and all that. In the United States, Burger King, which competes at McDonald's, has two people figuring out locations. And all they do is look at where McDonald's is putting their locations. <laughs> and, and it's a very powerful strategy. So they look at how McDonald's is opening up in Peoria, Illinois, in this corner. Okay, we'll, we'll take real estate in that corner, we'll open up over there too. They've done all the work, so they must be working. And it's worked really well for them. So the thing is, the Walmarts of the world, and the Burger Kings of the world, and the Microsofts of the world are a rarity. Most people do not want to do cloning because they think it's low. So in fact, even when I looked at Buffett's model, when I set up my own investment partnership, the Pabrai Funds, I replicated the Buffett partnerships. He closed his partnership in 1969. I opened my partnership in 1999, 30 years later. In 30 years, I could not find one example of a single fund anywhere in the world that had replicated the Buffett model, which was the most successful hedge fund ever created. Nobody replicated the model that ran for, from 56 to 69. And there were books published, the books I read, and the books had sold millions of copies and they were printed in many languages and all of that. Even, and, and the model was very simple. There's not, nothing special about the model. But, uh, and even today, forget 1999, today is 2013, I've been running a Bri Funds for uh, about almost 14 years, actually within 14 years, over 14 years. I've spoken at so many business schools, so many different places, and I've answered questions like you've asked. And I've asked the business school students that listen, 
there's no point paying fees to ISP. I'm sorry, have you already collected fully in advance? <laughs> Pardon? Half, half. Half? So you can still save half. Sorry, bro. I'm sorry, this is not a hack. But you can still save half. What you can do is, you don't need to even listen to the rest of the board in Q&A. You can walk out right now and start replicating. And every time I say this, nobody walks out. They want to keep paying tuition. So anyway, so first of all, the only thing I can figure out is, there's something in the human genome that makes cloning very attractive to maybe 1% or 2% of the population, or is that, or probably less than that. And for some reason, it makes it very unattractive. So I have found, because I've understood this, I have adopted cloning in a very serious manner. In fact, on my gravestone, they will write, and I hope they write, he was a cloner. That's it. In fact, if you look at even Dakshana, our model that works so well, it's not a model I came up with. I could never come up with such a good model. I'm too stupid to come up with a model like Dakshana. It was lifted from Super 30. So Anand Kumar, a great guy, came up with a great model. Just like Kmart came up with a great model and McDonald's does a great job. And all we had to do was, I asked Anand Kumar, hey, you know, do you have a problem if you clone your model? He says, no, I'll help you. So I said, okay, great. Now I can even clone and the guy was helping me. So it's great. So, so that was the first question. What was the second question? How do you actually do it? For example, you said 75% of the stock is implicit in the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's the crux. The real question. Okay, alright. I'm glad we're getting to the, like, the core issues right up front. You know, I don't have a newspaper in front of me. I should have brought one. But uh, because I will, one of the things, in fact, I'll do it maybe in my next presentation sometime is this is my plan for my next presentation to answer that question. I want to take like the Economic Times or Wall Street Journal or whatever. And I want to create a dartboard out of all the, the stock quotes page. You know, create a dartboard. Maybe I'll actually create a real dartboard. Have some unpaid intern do that. And then what I want to do, I want to take a dart and throw it at that dart, dart, dartboard. And whatever stock it ha lands on, I want to take that stock and just give you the statistics of that stock. So let's say, let's take a company in the US like um, General Motors. You know, huge company, car company, I don't know, close to 200 billion in sales, 150 billion. No, I think 200 billion in sales. If you look at the 52 week range on GM, General Motors, and you can do the same thing with Infosys, you can do it with uh, Tata Motors, you can do it with any company. You, know, you can just throw a dart basically. What you find is that in 52 weeks, which is in one year, the time you're saying the earth to go around once, General Motors was at one time being valued by, at $18 a share. In fact, just yesterday, it hit a 52 week high. It's uh, over $36 a share. So in one year, on this one stock, you have basically pretty much 50% movement. I mean, you, could, you know, you basically doubled the market cap from a year ago or whatever. So, and the business, the underlying business, has not changed that much, okay? If I look at Infosys, I don't know, you guys, what are the price of Infosys right now? 2800 I'm sorry? 2800 2800 rupees? And what is the 52-week low on it? Around 2200 Okay, and what's the 52-week high? I guess it's the high, I'm not wrong. So it's 22 to 2800 Yeah. Right, okay, so you have, you have a range of like 30% or so, okay? The reason you have these ranges, now if you look at any other asset class, so let's say I have a three-year-old uh, Maruti car, okay? The price I could get for that car a year ago, a three-year-old Maruti, and the price I can get today again, the same three-year-old Maruti, maybe within five or ten percent of each other, okay? Even for the most part, real estate, Movement is, is low. Stock, stock markets are different creatures. And the reason they're different creatures is because they are auction driven markets. So you don't, in the case of a car, you have an intelligent buyer facing an intelligent seller. And between the intelligent buyer and intelligent seller, they will arrive at the price of a car, that makes sense. And if they don't arrive at an intelligent price, there will be no transaction. So both sides have to agree. In the case of the stock market, you are basically faceless buyers and faceless sellers. 
and you have an auction driven mechanism for setting pricing. And auction driven mechanisms by their very nature are set up to create distortions. Warren Buffett has benefited big time from those distortions. So if there was no stock market, Buffett could not have done what he did. If let's say Warren Buffett were restricted from 1950 till today to only buy private companies from intelligent sellers, no way, no way anywhere close to what the record is today. It is because we have this mechanism of this auction driven market that we have this distortion. So if I went to buy GM a year back and I went to them today, the price would not change 100%. Okay, it would change five percent. Even, even if you, in the case of Infosys, you go to buy the whole company, and they give you a price today, and you go to them six months from now, the price will not change that much. So, bottom line is that it is the option driven nature of these markets that causes these wide distortions. And the second is that, especially when there is extreme fear or extreme greed, you will get attenuation of that distortion. So Infosys is something, for example, it is a blue chip company. But what if I pick something that is an obscure company? You know, let's say I pick some, you know, regional jute producer in Calcutta, something 100 crore market cap type thing. It will have a wider distortion. Okay, but that same company, if you go to do a private transaction to buy the company, you're not going to have those distortions. So the stock market is set up for cloners like me to have a field day. So, you know, the same thing you see in the public markets, you know, Facebook comes public, everyone's excited about Facebook, the stock price goes up like crazy, and, and then a few months later, no one's interested. And uh, that goes on all the time. So markets are constantly overshooting, sometimes where they significantly overvalue the, the companies, or they're significantly, significantly undershooting, where they're significantly undervaluing. And because of the significant over and undershooting, you can sit there. So bottom line is that if 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 you have that much of a swing, 50%, 100% type swing in a year, it means that there are enough companies out there that are not correctly priced at any given time. They are either underpriced or overpriced. Especially if you overlay on top of that distress, some kind of temporary situation which affects that business. That will cause even more attenuation of the pricing. Because the other thing that's happening in public markets is that any company typically in about two years, sometimes in one year, sometimes in six months, the entire turnover of the shareholder, shareholder base changes. So people aren't even holding the stocks that long. So all of these things basically mean that uh, some yo-yo like me can sit there, spend most of my time talking to you guys or hanging out with Dakshana scholars, and every once in a while I see distortions of an extreme nature. And when I see distortions of an extreme nature, then I act decisively. And I don't even need to be right all the time. I can be, in fact, John Templeton, who was a great investor, said that there is no investor who's right more than two or three times. So you can be wrong plenty of times, and you can still do fine. So I think that these, these distortions take place all the time. I think if you understand the business really well. So the first most important thing is circle of competence. Stick with it, things that you understand really well. If you understand things really well, you know what they're worth. And when the world is valuing it much below what it should be worth at, that's when you act to buy. And when the world is valuing it significantly above what it's worth at, then you sell it and you're done. Nothing else to do. So maybe you have two or three buys a year, maybe two or three sells a year, and we move on from there. Next question. So my doubt was basically like you said that evaluating a potential buy is by doing a dart. Yeah. No, no, no. Not no, no, no. Please. Are we up? You're putting words in my mouth. Did I say that? I said. I, I just said by throwing a dart, I can demonstrate to you the wide distortions that take place in stock prices. That's not how I pick stocks. So then, uh, like, what the matrix you use? Like, what uh, yeah. actual approach would you use for validating the potential? Like, um, so number one, I do not throw darts to pick stocks. In case that was not clear. So let me give you some some data points that might be useful. There were a couple of professors in uh, the U.S. I think one guy is at the University of Nevada, another guy is at Ohio State, and they wrote a paper where they looked at uh, every stock Warren Buffett bought for 30 years. 
from uh, 1975, uh, yeah, 1975 to 2005, 30-year period. And what they did is they, they did an analysis. They said that, okay, if you bought what Buffett bought, and you bought it after it was publicly known that he has bought it, and you bought it on the last day of the month that it was publicly known that he had bought it, and you bought it at the high price of the last day of the month, so the highest price it traded on that, on that day, which means that you go and find the worst possible broker on the planet and say, please give me the worst possible price you can get, and I want to buy it at that price. And then you held it till Buffett started selling the stock and it was known publicly that he was selling it. And you sold it on the last day of the month that it was public. And the price you got when you sold it was the lowest price on that last day of the month. And you did this for every stock that he bought and sold for 30 years. If you did that, you beat the index, the S&P 500, by 11.5% a year on average. And the S&P had done about 10% historically, so you were doing about 21.5% a year with no ISB degree required. Again, you know, you can walk out of the room right now and you can put this strategy to work because again, I've told so many business school students about the strategy and so far nobody has set up a fund to do this. And you know, like you were saying, why are they not replicating? Exactly. Why are they not replicating? It's still not too late. You can start a fund tomorrow which does this. Now what you do is you take a villa in Goa and you just go on vacation every day. And then the last day of the month, you come back from the swimming pool and just look at, okay, has Warren Buffett bought anything? Oh, okay, we bought uh, IBM. Okay, tell her, we'll buy IBM. Then you go back to your ocean surfing and swimming and whatever else you're doing in Goa till the end of the next month. And you know, you're done. So, so the bottom line is that uh, cloning, which I talked about, is a very powerful notion. Unfortunately, no business school professors have ever written, ever written any books on cloning that I'm aware of, that are any good. And uh, there are a few books on cloning, but they don't, they miss the point, I think. Bottom line is that so, so if you did what Buffett did, uh, what these professors said you should do, what Buffett did. You are already beating the S&P by around 11 percent point, 11, 11 percentage points a year. Most of what Pabrai Funds has done, at least for the last several years, is in, in fact, if I look at my portfolio, almost everything that we own was copied from some other great investor. But please don't tell anyone. Let's keep it a secret. Okay? Uh, are we recording this? Vikram, are we recording this? Okay, so we just keep for internal use. All right, don't put it on the web. We only want ISP to have an edge. Okay. So anyway, so so the thing is that if you were to, uh, so basically what I'm doing, you can say is a slight tweak to the paper that these professors wrote, where basically if you set up a fund, and all the fund does is clones the ideas of other great investors, but the only layers that I, I add to that is, I don't buy everything that the other grades are buying. I look at what they are buying, and then I look at the ones that I can understand. And the ones that I can understand and figure out, yes, this is very undervalued, and yeah, I think he's right about why he's buying it, those are the ones that buy. And that's it. And basically, limited to two or three decisions a year. That's it. So, not much else required. C.S. Balachandra. Yeah. Company Secretary. You know, I don't know where you are. Can you just raise your hand? Okay, great. Yeah. I just wanted to understand the relevance of uh, putting the topic uh, of investing and philanthropies. This is the topic uh, we received. Yeah. Uh, we are able to hear about uh, philanthropy. So, if you ask me, we can go there. Do you have a question on philanthropy? No, we just wanted to hear some thoughts on philanthropy also. Okay, because sure. we, we just heard the investing related uh, issues. Okay. Compounding and all. Actually, what you will find, and I'll maybe digress for a few minutes, and uh, not even digress, but I'll go into it for a few minutes. What you will find is it's the same as investing. There's really no difference. My personal biases of philanthropy, which I get to play out in Dakshana, are very simple. Basically, first of all, I feel that 
you know, my 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 father used to say, "Nange aaye hai, nange jana hai." You know, we come to the world naked, we leave this world naked. So since we have to leave the world naked. You know, then the question comes up that if you end up with more assets than you need, what do you do with them? Probably a lot of it because of Warren Buffett's influence. I think that for most people, the best thing to do is to recycle it back to society. So if you decide that you want to recycle, recycle excess assets back to society, then the question becomes: uh, How do you do that, and what do you what do you focus on? So some some basic principles. Number one. Which comes straight from investing is that if you are looking at two different charitable endeavors, endeavor A and endeavor B, you ought to be able to figure out which one delivers a higher return to society. If you really understand them, and once you figure out which one delivers a higher return to society, what you ought to do is put all of it into the higher return endeavor. So the first thing about philanthropy, my My philosophy is: you do not do sprinkling. You do not say, "I'll give uh, some money here, and I'll give some money here, and I'll give some money to this temple, and I'll give some money here." No, because that is really not going to maximize and optimize what society's benefit is. So, first thing is, it has to go single cause. It has to go to the cause that has the highest possible returns. In my case, uh, it was very easy to come to the conclusion that that uh, is likely. With investments in education towards alleviation of poverty, because I think that education has this a huge multiplier effect. So then, then you get to the point of saying, okay, I want to invest in education. I want to instead of giving a person a fish and you feed him for a day, you teach a person to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And so then the question comes up that if you want to teach fishing, what type of fisherman do you want to create? And so the model Dakshina has adopted is a very high ROI model because we have a partnership with the government of India. They do most of the heavy lifting. And we get to add on top of a great model. The returns we get on the funds that we invest, I think, are off the charts. And in fact, to demonstrate that, uh, maybe I can have Ashok come up. Ashok, can you come up for a second? Ashok Kumar is a Dakshina scholar who is a IIT Bombay student, and you finished two years or three years? There? Three years. So he's finished uh, three years at IIT Bombay. He's actually from Gachibali. He grew up here, right? Uh, in fact, I visited his uh, home in Gachibali with my daughter a couple of years back. I think two years back. So Ashok's father is a tailor. I think it's a, a lower class area where a lower economic strata area where he practices a profession. Very very modest uh, dwelling. In fact, uh, when I went to his home. My daughter and I could sit down on two chairs. The rest of the family had no chairs to sit on. And in fact, we were served tea on a very small stool, which could probably hold uh, maybe just the two cups of tea and some snacks. Ashok basically went to the Jawal and over there with the other Indian and Gachiboli. He got picked by us in tenth grade because he cleared our selection test. We we worked with him for two years on IIT prep, and then after two years, he took the uh, IIT entrance exam in uh, 2010. Right and. His all India rank was 63. 63 out of you know half a million kids who took the exam. So we should. <laughs> and, uh, it's a single generation transformation in my mind from zero to hero of that family. In terms of what we invested, we could never do that for the family if we were not riding on a great platform. And Ashok is now uh, interning at Microsoft, also in Gachibali. And basically, I think the the future. Of his family is going to look very different very soon. So I don't know if you want to add something, Ashok. Yeah. Maybe you can answer this question. <laughs> the question is like you know, plan to be like, what do you think of the Dakshina model? Yeah. What do you think we're doing in this? Ha, uh, I am uh, Ashok Kumar. I stay in Chandanagar here. Uh, in my tenth class, I wrote my Dakshina entrance test and it got selected. That Dakshina is a uh, it's a foundation which helps the poor students who cannot afford for JE coaching, and they'll help you get it free of cost. And I came from a poor background, uh, and I don't think my parents would have given me coaching at that price. 
I would have studied, I would have continued my studies without any coaching and I would land up in some local college here but really it's because of Dakshina I am in this position now and I am proud of it. I will be completing my fourth year, I will be graduating the next year from IIT Bombay in computer science department. I recently interned at Microsoft, yesterday was my last day of internship there. Next question. Yeah, yeah. Go, go, go. Sorry. Hi, I, I uh, had a question on back on the investing side. Uh, my name is Tom Island. I am an ISP alum and I manage an early stage venture capital fund focused on nuts and bolts businesses here in India. Uh, I, I just had a question. Uh, uh, you put up a slide earlier around uh, your fee structure, and there's something 800 or 900 basis point difference between your net of fees and actually the return. Yes. Um, I'm curious as to how that works with the concept. My, uh, my investors love my fee structure. In fact, if the entire fund invest in, uh, industry adopted my fee structure, the industry would disappear. So, so my fee structure, which was copied straight from Warren Buffett, is there are zero management fees. I don't get paid anything for assets under management. Uh, the first 6% of returns go to the investors. Above 6%, I get one fourth and they get three fourths. So if you're up 10%, I get 1%, it's subject to high water marks. If you're up 5%, we get nothing, and if you're down, we get nothing. Like I said, if the industry adopted that fee structure, which I would love them to do, they would just disappear. And, and the second part related to that is, I mean, not, not everyone is a natural stock picker or a cloner. Uh, so for those that want to build wealth, and perhaps just buy into the S&P, I mean, do you subscribe to a Jack Bogle view, just buy an ETF, buy, buy a, a fund with a very low load and then kind of set it and let it go? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I give this talk, I say that, you know, let's say you had a 70 IQ and you say that, hey, I want to do the best I can. So I would say, okay, you know, 70 IQ, uh, you can buy an index fund. And then someone comes and says, hey, you know, I have an 85 IQ. I'm better than the 70 IQ guy. Can you do better? Can I do better than that? I said, yeah, of course you can do better than that. You can buy Berkshire Hathaway stock and just hold it. High probability will be better than the index. And then someone says, well, I'm a 100 IQ. Can I do better than the 85 IQ? And I say, of course you can. And uh, then I say, no, just read the paper by those two professors and replicate that. But then someone says, I have a 120 IQ. And then I would say, why don't you just do what I'm doing? And above 120 IQ is useless for investing. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah, right. Hi, my name is Raj. I'm an ISBL. Uh, okay, uh, 2007 to 2009, when uh, you had negative return. Uh, my question is uh, you obviously you guys analyzed what happened. So, what went wrong and what amendments were made up? I'm sorry, repeat. So, uh, what went uh, what went wrong? Yeah, what went wrong and when? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Well, I think that you know we don't learn anything from success. It's really when we stumble that we learn a lot. And in fact, I'm very grateful. Every time in my life when I've stumbled, it has led to growth and it has led to learning and stuff. And I think that that period from 2007 to 2009 was a wonderful period from a growth and learning perspective. In fact. We are, I'm reaping a lot of the rewards of some of the lessons already. So, well, I think one of the things that went wrong was hubris. I had gone from, literally from, I mean, the, the entire period the funds ran from 99 to 2007, we never had a down year. So not only did we do 37.2% of fees, we never had negative returns in any single year. Including the period, that period, including the popping of the NASDAQ bubble, and all that. Even through all that period, we, in fact, that helped us because there were all these other stocks that were undervalued. And so I think there was uh, hubris in the sense that uh, maybe a bit of uh, build up of uh, thinking that uh, couldn't do anything wrong. And the second was that I never at all saw the housing bubble. I completely missed seeing that. There were investments that I had made which, in hindsight, were very dependent on a functioning financial system. So basically what happened in 2008 and 2009 was that 
the financial system in the US basically was out of oxygen. It just couldn't breathe. And so I had companies that were dependent on, uh, in my portfolio, who were dependent on access to cap capital markets, access to financing, access to all that. And then when you just cut that off, they just went on a tailspin. And, and of course, I run a concentrated portfolio. So we, like in one case, a uh, company called Delta Financial, we took a $65 million loss. 65 million to zero, you know. And another case, we took almost a 40 million dollar loss. So we had, we had, on one hand, we had permanent losses in some cases, which took us down. In other cases, what happened is uh, the entire market fell down. You know, like I was saying, that things get overvalued, undervalued. We had things that were solid, solid businesses. They were just knocked down in price. And the big problem I had at that time was that we were fully invested and we had no ability to be offensive, to actually go and buy. The best thing at that time would have been to go and buy, but we had, I had no cash. Not only did I not have cash, but I had redemptions from investors. So I had to raise cash to redeem people. And I'm basically exiting them and exiting positions, which are pennies on the dollar. So that compounded the problem. So one basic lesson, cash is king. One of the reasons I put in those rules where returns need to be at least 5x or greater for the last 10% of cash is that that's hard to find. That's not easy to find. And that means you're basically riding with a cushion. So most of last year, we were sitting on more than 20% of cash, for example. In fact, even now I'm sitting on just around 10% of cash. So that's a big change from literally from the time I started in 95 till 2007, there were very few periods where we actually had held cash. We always were almost fully invested. So one change we made is a, a very healthy appreciation for holding cash. The other change, uh, the other two changes I made were came up with this investment checklist, which is a whole different presentation. But basically it's very powerful. It's looking at the mistakes that other great investors have made and why they made them and whether those uh, mistakes would have been, been obvious to spot at the time the investment was made. And in many cases it is. Uh, you know, someone makes an investment, you can tell right up, right up front that there's a problem. And so the checklist has been very useful in catching those. I started having a conversation with another investment manager, which has been very useful. And then the cash, of course, has been uh, useful. And uh, basically, I think that maybe I'll uh, digress a little bit. Uh, you know, when uh, one of the biographies in Warren Buffett came out, Snowball, which was written by Alice Schroeder, she said that uh, as a kid, when Warren Buffett was a child, he used to walk in a strange way. He used to walk with his knees kind of somewhat bent and then walk. And, and the reason he did that was to absolutely take out any probability of him falling. Very careful kid, uh, you know, not trying to fall. And in fact, the way Warren, Warren Buffett picks stocks is the same. He's extremely, uh, spent most of his time on the downside. He looks at how can I lose money? Is where he spends most of his time and energy, not how much money can I make on this? What, what will cause me to lose money on it? Just like, you know, how will I fall down? What, what will cause me to fall down? And so there's a much greater appreciation since 2000, 2007 or 2009 on the downside. So I just spend a lot more and the checklist of those forces that. But I question and re-question many, many times, how would I lose money on an investment? And uh, if I can absolutely convince myself that I can't, and even then, of course, we will be wrong, uh, it has lowered the error rate. So those are some of the lessons. Yeah. Uh, hi, Manish. This is Madhusudan. I have two questions, uh, so I'll take up the first part of it. Uh, you scan almost uh, globally in different countries and different companies uh, in various sectors. So, in one of your interviews, you have quoted, uh, I have invested only in two companies in India, and I don't do it because of regulatory hassles or whatever there. So, if there is, uh, there, uh, there are few companies who generally pop up on your radar, like uh, few bits, big bits, and infrequent bits. Even if you don't invest, uh, can you just quote what companies generally pop up on your radar? Uh, sure, I haven't. I actually, yeah. So the Indian market, you know, for uh, for me as a U.S. investor, you know, I would have to come into a P note and all of that, and that's just cumbersome. I think the second is the Indian markets quite different 
from the US markets in, in one sense, in the sense that I um, hardly ever, basically almost never uh, meet managements. I hardly ever visit businesses. I basically, uh, you can call me an armchair investor. So I'm really not interested in, uh, you know, going and understanding the people that are meeting them and all of that. In India, if I were to follow the approach I follow the US, I think I'd get my head handed to me because, you know, the the opportunity in India. So if I were an investor who focused on India, I would focus on businesses that had major growth ahead of them. You know, businesses that can do a 10x or 20x in five years or 10 years. You know, significant growth. And there are many, many areas of the Indian economy that have that potential to have that growth. So it almost becomes like private equity investing or venture capital investing if you want to do that. And so in fact, if I were investing in India, I would not want to be restricted to public markets. I would want to be, I would have a fund that would allow me to do all of the above. Private, public, real estate, any, any anything that I want to do. So I would set up a different structure. If I wanted to do that structure, I could not do it armchair investing. I would have to uh, be able to handicap the nature of management and all of that. And I'm able to do that in the US because the businesses that I invested in have very long histories. And the managements have very long histories. And in the United States, I can make a, almost a definitive statement that the probability that I lose money on an investment because of fraud is pretty close to zero. In fact, I can't think of a single case in the past 18 years as an investor that I've lost money on an investment because of fraud. I have lost money on investment because of my stupidity, but not because of fraud. In India, I could not make that statement. So there are plenty of very high quality entrepreneurs. Uh, there are plenty of low quality entrepreneurs and you'd have to sift them out. So my uh, biases are that I like to just sit in an armchair. And my wife will tell you, he doesn't work at all. And I have no interest in, you know, kicking the tires and going and meeting businesses and trying to figure out Basically, you know, the venture capital approach is you have to forecast ahead without too many trend marks behind you. And that's just not a game that I either would be good at playing or even have an interest in playing. So I think that the Indian markets, uh, I'd have to move here to do that. I'd have to do it oh, be the only thing I'm doing. So there'd just be a number of structural changes that I'd have to make that aren't that exciting for me to make. I have no Indian stock tip for you because I have really not followed the Indian markets. But what I would suggest is you can do the same thing, which is to the extent that Indian markets require disclosure, you should find out who the, the good investors are and look at what they're doing. So I can tell you some names of people I admire in India. I, I think Chetan Parikh is very good. I think uh, Amitabh Singhi in Delhi is very good. I think that uh, I think the Dalmia brothers are very good. So these are just some names I know about, you know, so if you track some of these and there probably are many more of them, then uh, that might be a good place to see what they are doing and then figure it out. So. Thanks, Manish. My next question is, uh, uh, in one of your interviews, you said uh, in one of your funds, you have invested almost 60% of it in one stock and you would even stretch to 90% provided you had the funds. And you have quoted one book to read to get an idea about that particular stock. So even if you are not comfortable with sharing the company, can you share the sector? Uh, Actually, I, I don't think I ever said that. Which, which magazine was that in? Uh, I don't remember. I was just googling and reading all your reviews. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I haven't ever put... Uh, well, I, I think, let me, let me correct that. I think, yeah, then there you are. I, when, when I invest uh, Dakshina's assets, we do so in a very concentrated manner. Uh, not, the, not the funds, but the Dakshina Foundation. And yeah, the foundation is willing to absolutely place a single stock as the whole pie. We have no problem doing that. Of course, uh, I should just correct that. The thing is we have different pools of money. And one of the pools is money that comes from outside my family. So money that comes from outside my family just sits in money market. It doesn't get invested. The money that my own family puts into Dakshina, uh, we, want to, we want to maximize returns. There is one particular stock. The foundation has a big stake in. I think it will do very well and it shall go nameless and I can't tell you much more it's, about it. It's a US or an Indian stock you mean? That's it's not a, definitely not an Indian stock based on my earlier comments. Okay. And it's not even a US stock. So there you go. We have about a hundred all other countries you can think about. 
Uh, okay, so next question. Hi, sir. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Chaitanya. I have a question regarding investment. So, one of the central themes of uh, Warren Buffett's investing is the presence of mold around companies that he looks at. But your concept of cloning, as I understand, it might be in conflict with that mold. Or could you just please clarify on that? Like, uh, there is a difference between the cloning part and the presence of a mold. Because the presence of a mold actually means they have very less competition and they have good returns on the capital. But cloning essentially, like I'm copying another guy in a business, so my returns actually reduce. Buffett is a multi-dimensional investor. There are, I would say, dozens of investments, if not uh, 50 plus 100 or 100 investments he's made, where it's not more based. To give you an example, I think maybe around 10 years back, he bought uh, he bought the debt of uh, Finova Capital. Finova is a, like a subprime lender in the U.S. that was going bankrupt. So he bought the debt and he bought a lot of the debt. So he basically got into a position where he could participate in the restructuring of the business. That business did not have much of more. What, what he wanted to do was just, they had a portfolio. There were certain, you know, statistics of loss that you would have in the portfolio. So he wanted to run the portfolio, which means just get all the loans paid off, etc. and just keep the residue. So there are dozens of investments Buffett has made and continues to make are not based on moats. In fact, uh, he's done lots and lots of arbitrage deals. In fact, he used to do a lot of it in the 50s and 60s. So I would say that uh, Buffett prefers to buy, buy moats. And I think now with the size of the capital he has, the odds are heavy that he would go mostly more based but that's not all he does. He does all sorts of things that are non more based so it's not in conflict i think the cloning the cloning thing is you know you can uh, you know let's say you did the following let's say you picked uh, four or five investors that you thought were exceptional and let's say you say that i'm going to pick the best of their ideas which i can understand within my circle of competence maybe even the ones that have a moat etc you put some criteria on that you know you can skip the ones that don't have moats. you can skip the ones that you don't understand so cloning is not uh, in conflict with moats. You know, you could clone saying I'll only look at the ones with bones, for example. But I, I, my take is that it's not, it's not so much about the quality of the business, in my opinion. I think it's more about what you pay for it. To some extent, that is a part of the equation. So you can, you can actually do extremely well investing in a business that is quote unquote a shallow moat if you pay it next to nothing for it. Of course, the ideal situation is to buy a business with a great moat at a great price, or even a fair price. There's there's many different ways to skin the investing cat. Moats are just one way to do it. And you know, I'll just take this one step further. You know, Charlie Munger, Buffett's partner, says that you can be a very very successful investor if you live in some small town in the U.S., let's say Peoria, Illinois, or something, and you just bought. For example, the McDonald's franchise in that town. Uh, you bought the best apartment building in that town. You bought the best office building in that town. Let's say you bought the Ford dealership in that town. And those are the four assets you owned. Okay, and when you when I say bought, bought, let's say you could even buy fractions of them. You know, you might own ten percent of McDonald's, for example. So if 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 you constructed a portfolio which had those four assets. And it doesn't need to be purely or not, it could be Aurangabad and Maharashtra, for example, you could do the same thing there. So someone looking at the portfolio from the outside would say, this is not diversified, it's all in the same geography. That's true, it's in the same geography. But the odds are very, very high that if a person bought those four assets and he bought them at reasonable prices and he never touched them in terms of selling them or anything, over a lifetime he do extremely well. If you look at the competence, circle of competence of an investor like that, it's this small. They've, they've invested in something just in their geography, in just four asset classes and very basic asset classes. So you don't need to do esoteric things to do well as an investor. I think the simplicity is very powerful and keeping it simple is really, really, I think, uh, important. So, Next question. What time would you like to end, Vikram? Any questions from Dakshna scholars? Well, uh, uh, I'm Arun Prakash from Cognizant. So I have a doubt, like currently the markets are so volatile in uh, world over. Like uh, I think this is, a, this is a problem of over analysis of something. 
Sometimes when we are talking about the European economic crisis, and uh, uh, currently we are talking about Fed tapering, and sometimes back there we are talking, talking about fiscal crisis. So, what is the uh, what is the point of over analyzing all this? Yeah, so actually, for the most part, you should ignore macro. So, you know, going back to my example of the McDonald's franchise and Ford dealership, etc. You know, there is a, you know, I live in Irvine, California. There is a McDonald's, which is, uh, I don't know, three, four miles from my house. Recently, they they made their drive through 24 hours. So, actually, you can't go to the restaurant 24 hours, but you can drive through and pick up stuff anytime, 4 a.m., 3 a.m., anytime. And in fact, that, that McDonald's is so well run and does so much business. So what is the impact of any of the factors that you are talking about on the cash flow that McDonald's will produce this month or next month or next year or two years from now or five years from now? Is it that? So I've always believed that the micro in many, many ways trumps the macro. And so, if you were looking, let's say that McDonald's came on sale. Let's say it came on sale for $5 million, for example. And let's say your family had a net worth of $10 million. The question is, you know, is that an asset that you would put $5 million into? And let's say it was producing, uh, you know, $400,000 a year in cash flow, for example. So it's, you know, at 12 times cash flow or something. So, you know, the, the question you would ask yourself if you were looking at that sort of a transaction, you would ask yourself, well, how long can that 400,000 a year in cash flow continue? Can it increase? What would affect it to go down, etc.? And so it would be factors around that McDonald's that would dominate that discussion. It is completely irrelevant what the Fed policy is and completely irrelevant what exchange rates are and all these things. All those things become irrelevant. As an investor, you're always better off focusing in on the business because the eventual kind of, you know, results of the business, 90% of it will be from what happens inside the business. So I would say that I, when I look at, uh, at the McDonald's as an example of, you know, only own business you can buy, the same thing applies if you're looking at, looking at stocks is you have to look at it as if you're buying the whole company. So the first thing I would ask is, someone mentioned the stock price of Infosys. What is the market cap of Infosys? Anyone know the market cap? I'm sorry? Around 1.4 lakh crores. 1.4 lakh crores? No, I, I'm sorry. Okay, so anyway, let's, I can't give what to say, but let's say, let's say there's a, there's a company in India that has a market cap of let's say 5,000 crores. And let's say the stock trades at, I don't know, let's say 200 rupees. I'm really not interested in the 200 rupee price. I'm, do, I'm interested in the 5,000 crores. So the question I would ask myself is, if my family has 9,000 crores or 8,000 crores in total assets, will I put 5,000 crores into this company and be happy to own it for 10 years? And if the answer is no, which is probably the case, then I'm not even I'm not interested in buying one share at 200 rupees. So those are the types of questions that an investor should be asking: is is if this were 70 percent of my family's assets and I could not sell it for five years, would I buy it? I think if you just ask that question, that will save you a lot of trouble later on. Maybe we can get at least one question from the black shirts. Yeah, we've got a question here. The so, mic is the mic is over, we've got one in the back too. Okay, go ahead. Please tell me what year you are and what your plans in life are as well. Sir, uh, I want to indicate what you have done and still doing. And but the problem is that I don't have a even pies in my pocket. So what do you would say that how should I proceed? I'm sorry you have to repeat, I, I, I couldn't fully understand. I want to replicate what you have done. Okay, you want to replicate? Great, you want to be a cloner? All right. And we clap for the cloner. Okay, you want to replicate what I've done? Yeah. But, sir, uh, I have no money in my hand, but I want to replicate you. So, okay. what does it say? How to proceed? Very simple. 
First of all, what uh, when did you join Darshan or Darshan? This year or last year? Last year. Last year. Okay. So, are you going to join IIT? Yes, sir. Okay. What is your rank going to be? Uh, below thousand. Pardon? Below thousand. Okay. So, top thousand. All right. Very good. So, there is another talk I gave, which I am going to give you the abbreviated version. It's called a secret. Okay. The secret to becoming very wealthy. That's what you want, right? Okay, so here's the secret. How many hours are there in a week? The Dakshana scholar said 168 hours, okay. When you start working full time, let's say you finish your degree in IIT and you join Infosys or something, how many hours a week are you required to work? Ashok, how many hours? 40, 40, 45, in the US is 40 hours, let's say 45 hours. So uh, let's say 50 hours. We want to work hard for our employer. So 50 hours, how many hours are left? One one eight. One one eight. Okay, so even if you take out time for sleeping and other things, what you will find is that you are basically left with at least another 30 or 40 hours that you could do something else. Okay, so the something else, you can spend it with your friends and watching movies and enjoying yourself or you can spend it in your Swami, Swami Vivekananda single-minded pursuit of maximum wealth. So what do you want to spend it on, with friends or to maximize wealth? Maximize wealth. Maximize wealth, okay. So that is what I did. So basically, when I when I graduated with a degree in engineering, I took a job, and they required me to work 40 hours a week. After three years of working, I had an idea of something I wanted to do. So what I said is, okay. I used to get very good reviews with my employer. I said, I no longer care about the review, how good I'm doing. That's irrelevant. My objective was once I knew what I wanted to do, my idea of my business was to not get fired. They should not tell me you have lost your job because I need the cash flow. So I just did enough to make sure that I'm not fired. And so what I used to do is from 7 in the morning to about 8.30 in the morning before I went to work, I used to work on my business. And then about, about 6 o'clock or so, I would come home till about midnight. I would work on the business. And then all weekend I would work on the business. And anytime I had client meetings or anything like that, I took a vacation day. So my, I could even take half a day vacation. So I had vacation built up. So anytime, so basically the paycheck is coming in. Someone is paying me, right? This business I was trying to do, if it did not work, you know, there would not be much cost because I'm, I still have a job. And I was, I was working for it for my home. And it took me about uh, 10 months from the time I started this focused activity. I was 24 years old till the time I got my first client. So 10 months I was just continuing to do different things. And then finally the first client arrived. And then after about two weeks, the second client arrived. But I had the first two clients, I had more money coming up. And I explained to him that, hey, you know, I've started my own business and uh, it seems to be taking off and now I'm going to go to my business. So they tried very hard for me not to leave. And then they told me, my boss and his boss, they called me and they said, you know, we could not understand. You were doing so well. And then last 10 months, you were not doing so bad that we were to fire you. But it was not what we used to see before. I said, exactly. That's what I was trying to do, is not get fired, just barely, you know, stay above firing level. So then they told me that, okay, they did not say if, they said when your business fails, not if your business fails. They said when your business fails, come back here, a much higher salary, they gave me a offer to pay me a lot more. They said just anytime the business fails, come back, we would love to have you. So I said, this is fantastic, okay. <laughs> I have my four months from this client, full full efforts behind it to get more clients. And if it fails, no need to even look for a job. Just go back, higher pay. Okay? 
Why? Because of the secret. You basically have the time to do two jobs. Everyone thinks you should only do one job. And so what you do is you do your second job. And if it fails, no problem. Start something new. Fails, no problem. Start something new. And just keep going, something will hit. And as you keep doing things, you learn more things and you'll just keep going from there. So that's how I started my first IT company, Transtech. And then that uh, grew and did well. And then later I could then uh, leave that and start Pabrai Funds and here we are. So great question. Other questions, we have another question here. One billion dollars. Is that you are enthusiastic or you are some fear in your mind? No, I had, I had no fear. Uh, the reason I had no fear is because, you know, if the one million was gone, I still had experience, qualifications, I still had my business. There were many ways that I could uh, recover. Even today, even today, I am, I am not at all worried about, I mean, let's say for example, something happened where I lose everything. Of course, that would be, uh, maybe for two days I'll be sad if everything is gone. People have been through adversity, have been through much worse adversity than what, uh, you know, there's a saying, if wealth is lost, nothing is lost. If health is lost, something is lost. If character is lost, everything is lost. So, you are only talking about the first one. So, wealth is lost, nothing is lost, no problem. Sir, how to found, uh, find a found of funds? Means that how you started to found your power of funds? How do I find my what? What is the procedure of uh, making a fund? Means that your power of funds you found it? Yeah. So what was the procedure? Yeah, so I just copied what Warren Buffett did. There was a Buffett Partnerships in the uh, 1950s. There was a book written which had a chapter on exactly what that fund did. I copied that chapter, I went to a lawyer, I said, copies and he created the fund that's it it cost uh, eight thousand dollars and we were in business and before I spent eight thousand my friends already told me they want to put one million dollars to start the fund so so actually the, yeah, the, the thing is uh, if there are things that you don't understand and anytime we do things there are things that we don't understand in fact even when Dakshina started there were lots of things we did not understand. The first thing we did not understand is how to find scholars. So, you know, we copied Anand Kumar's model. But Anand Kumar every year has 10,000 people who show up at his doorstep to take his test. Today, no, tomorrow. Tomorrow is his test, right? Tomorrow is his selection test. There will probably 5,000 or 10,000 people taking that test. And then he'll pick the 30 kids and, you know, go from there. So, when Dakshina started, and if you hold some tests, nobody would show because nobody knows us, right? So one question I was trying to figure out is how will we ever find any scholars and how will they find us? And it was an important question. We did not know the answer. So this is what I did. I started Dakshana and I hired in India a consultant. This guy was a IIT Madras grad. He was like 64 years old. And I told him, I want you to just do research, Dakshana, on these things, like, you know, how do we find scholars and how do we train them, how do we do things. Go meet anyone who is willing to meet you. Go meet all the coaching schools. And uh, I told him, for example, we can tell the coaching institute that if somebody comes to them, they don't have money, send them to us. Many things like that. And I told him that uh, every day he works for us, he'll get paid uh, 5,000 rupees. So I said, if you spend one day on us, 5,000 rupees. If you spend less than a day, 500 rupees an hour. So just bill whatever time you spent, send me the bill, I'll pay you. You just keep doing research. And so he started going and meeting people. And I think uh, three or four times when he met people, they told him, you should look at JNB. And he had never heard of JNB before. So after the third person told him, look at JNB, he decided to look at JNB. Okay? And then we found JNB and now you are here. Okay? So basically, we did not know, whenever you start a business, you don't know the answers. You don't know all the answers, which is okay. You need to know a few answers. And you need to make sure you uh, reduce your risk. 
that guy was paying 500 rupees or 5,000 rupees a day, if he worked full time for one month, it'd be one lakh rupees. If he worked full time for three months, it's three lakh rupees. No problem. I'm willing to just lose that money. Three lakh rupees gone is not going to be a problem. Uh, they don't uh, have a model today that makes money, but they'll figure it out. So you don't need to figure out everything on day one. In fact, you figure it out. If you're even with Sam Walton at Walmart, he just kept learning as he went along, and that's how you do it. So, important thing to understand when you start a business is you need to have passion, you need to have drive, you do not need money, and but passion and drive are important. So, you said in the starting that Rajat Gupta lost everything because of this EMI. So, how do we pick up the EMI in you from you? Is that, what is your view about this? Uh, how to get rid of envy? Yes. Envy and ego, right? Or envy? Yes. Envy, though, you know, basically, uh, you know, it's related to being jealous. I would say that do not be envious. Try to understand how they got better marks, how can I, what can I learn from them, how can I improve myself. But do not be envious about them and do not have ill thoughts. You know, Buffett says that, uh, actually, Charlie Munger says that in Judaism, they came up with the Ten Commandments. You know, Moses came up with the Ten Commandments. And all those Ten Commandments have to do with the basic sins of humanity. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's farm, etc. These are all envy related. So basically, the most very important trait is not to be envious. Uh, there will always be people who do better than you. There will be a lot more people who do worse than you. The important thing is to focus on, you have to focus on what you can do to improve yourself. But do not carry anything with you. In fact, we, we saw in Rajat Gupta, one of the most successful people, for a very simple reason. I mean, he had more money than he could have ever, ever spent in his life. And he lost reputation that took a lifetime to build. That probably will never come back. Everyone who knows him will tell you that he is a first class person. Envy is a very dangerous thing, in my opinion. Other questions? Girls? Yeah, we've got a question here. I'm not much aware about uh, this so called business and and yet we got completely what you talked today instead of something you were as a student. But uh, I have one I don't know one thing that uh, I think you're not much interested in Indians farm. Indians business uh, farm. So I want to know why what the problem in Indian farms? Oh, okay. So, uh, good question. Well, uh, we're gonna have a seat. I think the reason the reason I gave is that uh, one of the big stumbling blocks in investing with Indian firms is I need to be in India, and the way my life is set up, I'm not in India, and so it's really 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 hard for me to get an advantage versus other investors who are based here if I try to do it from sitting in California. So. I think you need you need to be closer to these markets and a lot closer to the uh, the CEOs and principals of the companies if you are going to try to do a good job. Just the way my life is set up, I can't do that. So there, it doesn't mean there's no opportunity. There's lots of opportunity in India. Lots of opportunity to do really well. Lots of firms that one can do very well with, but not a place where necessarily I can do well. So I have to play a game that I know I can do well at. And if I were to sit in Irvine, California and try to invest in Indian stock market or Indian companies, I'm probably not going to do very well at it. Because so there are so many Indians who want to do very well in business and sector, but if they want to serve India, so they have to stay here. Yes. So is there better opportunity in India also? Absolutely. I think, I think in fact, I think it's questionable whether it, Many of you do, would do better if you went outside India. I think if you stay here, there's plenty of opportunity. So India served us for many years, so we do have to serve. We are counting on you to do that. <laughs> so I hope you do that. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Manish. It was really a thought-provoking session. It's really hard. I mean, it's really great to see a lot of youngsters. 
learning the way of investing and in, I would say rather the ways of life. You know, we should not angry, we should not have ego and all. And yeah, hopefully, you know, some of us, especially the ISB students, will try to successfully, you know, copy the cloning and you know, like make us a successful man investment management firm. And then we wish you all the best in your next seven and a half years. You'll like probably make more than much more than thirty six percent of it. Thanks.